So thank you. And with that set up, you'll only be disappointed by what you see. But uh, yeah, so just to kind of go through the kind of objectives of this lecture, um, you know, this is going to be kind of like the first formal introduction to inverse solvers. So up to this point, most of the work has been kind of looking at forward models. How do you describe what will happen to light when you know exactly what the optical properties within tissue are? And it's been alluded to on how you actually solve this inverse problem. But um, today, I'll be talking about this inverse adding doubling approach, which is, I think, historically the first inverse solver that's been applied to biological tissue in terms of optical techniques. And the interesting part of it is, you know, the first objective is just to understand exactly what this adding doubling method is. And, you know, it's compelling for the fact that it is an exact solution of the radio of transport equation. So again, that was something that has been introduced and probably thrown around a couple times um, in previous lectures. But it's a beast, and it's a very difficult uh, equation to work with. But under very simplified conditions, this adding doubling is an exact solution to that. And again, this is looking at slabs of tissue. So, um, you know, this condition only works under special cases. And it's basically looking at what light goes into tissue, what goes through it, and what comes back out. Um, but then going into how do we actually use these solutions, this forward model of this adding doubling approach to actually use the measurements to infer what is actually going on inside. So this inverse solving problem, so this inverse adding doubling, which later on in this lecture will be referred to IA as IAD. Um, but again, here we actually use the measured total reflectance and transmittance of a thin slab of tissue to actually infer what are the absorption and scattering properties within. And then spend some time to actually think about what does it actually take to actually use this type of model to describe tissue in a practical sense in terms of experimental conditions and you know how do you actually set up an experiment, set up an instrument to actually enable this inverse adding doubling approach. So for the outline of this talk, I just want to kind of reiterate some of the things that have been uh, spoken before in probably day one of this course um, and go into details on what is adding doubling, the principles of its oper operation, also what the inverse model would look like and how do you actually consider this in terms of a physical experimental setup. And then try to summarize some of the take home messages. There's appropriate times to use this approach. There are other situations where it's just not appropriate to use and very difficult. So um, to try to give you some guidance on that. And you know, give some examples of how this is, has, has been used here at uh, UCI. Um, to enable some of the studies that we've been doing here. And then just kind of conclude and wrap things up. So I like to keep everything kind of informal. So if you have any questions, just interrupt me. That's completely fine. So <clears throat> to start off, I um, just want to kind of give a little bit of a refresher on some of the concepts that were introduced on the first day of this workshop. So in general, a forward model describes what happens to light in a media as a function of the properties of that medium. And so for tissues, you know, we've been all introduced to concepts like mu A, the absorption coefficient, mu S, prime, mu S and mu S prime, the scattering coefficient or reduced scattering coefficient, G, this anisotropy factor, and N, index of refraction. Uh, but given those, you can use these forward models to say if, if these are the properties of the tissue, you can generate an output of what comes out of that tissue in terms of radiance. So this variable L. And different models will describe it within the volumes of tissue or at the boundaries of tissue. And so for the adding doubling approach, just to kind of 
uh, prime muon, all that. It's a method that will describe the radiance at the boundaries of tissue. So, as opposed to a forward model, the inverse model now tries to take everything and get the opposite output. So again, it's something where you'll take the radiance information, which is something physical that you can measure, and tries to use that to infer what are the parameters within this model that could generate that. So what are the optical properties within the tissue based on what you get out of it? And so, in general, um, most of the measurable outputs that you'll get are not sufficient to actually describe all the different things within the tissue. So this is this constant question a lot of people, especially in the field of tomography, will refer to as an ill-posed problem. So, you know, the complexity within the tissue, the parameters that you would use in your forward model, are not uniquely described by what you get out of it. So there's always some confusion. People will try to put constraints on the problem to try to simplify it. Um, but that's always the struggle that we have. We can be really good at describing what would happen to light, but when we measure light, what we're not as good as at is to try to understand what happened to it when it was actually in, you know, interacting with the tissue itself. So, but in the end, you know, there's, through a careful selection of which model you actually choose, the assumptions that you can make on the tissue itself, so what can you measure, what do you just assume to be present all, the, all along, if you constrain the geometry of the tissue you're trying to um, measure, and think about the instrumentation and the techniques that you can actually use to probe that tissue, you can at least get some chance of trying to infer what are the optical properties of tissue based on the model that you have chosen to describe what happens to light in that tissue. So, as I've already alluded to, there, there are a variety of models and methods that have been developed. And again, each one has their own strengths and weaknesses. And typically, this can be described in terms of, you know, computational processing speed versus accuracy. You can have something really fast, but not, might not be precise. Or you can have something that's really complicated, and it will just take a long time for you to actually um, process the data you collect. There's also, in terms of the experimental conditions, you know, the complexity of your, the measurement you make and the acquisition time. So again, if you're looking for something that's going to be a very dynamic process, it's sometimes disadvantageous to actually have something that's going to be more precise and more complicated because it will take more time to actually acquire the data. There's going to be the questions of sensitivity to spatial heterogeneity. Again, these are all tissues that will be finite in spatial extent. So what's important for you? Is it something that's going to be somewhat homogeneous over the region you interrogate? Or is this going to be a highly structured tissue that you really need to account for? And also costs of in instrumentation, which goes into the complexity of the system. Is how much will it actually cost to actually build an instrument that will be the one thing designed to answer the questions that you really want versus you know, can you get away with something, just a simple idea, low cost, be able to do multiple measurements from that system. So, just a kind of general statement about successful research. It's the ability to actually understand when and or where, where each method that you would have at your disposal. These are all just tools. It's just how you use it and know what the limitations of each technique is before you go into it. So if you're looking to try to get an answer towards something, it's more important to know exactly what the course and what the type of model you would use can't do, what that upper bound is um, before you go and use it, because that way you'll know when you hit that limit and know what other options there might be that you can employ. So, okay. So going into this adding doubling method specifically. So from the second lecture, um, you know, there is this whole concept of radiance and based off of this radiative transport equation. And, you know, it's a six-dimensional 
parameter, actually seven if you include time. Um, so you have all your spatial coordinates, angular coordinates, and a temporal component if you want. But what adding doubling does, and the way it's able to kind of be a, an exact solution of, of the radio transport, is that it simplifies everything down to a one-dimensional case. So rather than considering all the different angles, all the different spatial coordinates, it says, I'm just going to go through and look at things and look at light as it goes forward or backward. And in the process of going forward or backward, you can have different things happen in tissue. So you can have absorption events, you can have scattering or multiple scattering events, but when that happens, the simplification is it either just goes forward or back. So one dimension, x, no angular component, the, ang well, the angular component is either a positive or negative direction, and it just collapses the entire equation down to this one dimension. And by doing so, you can actually come up with a simple solution set for the radiance in the forward or backward direction, which are just these kind of coupled exponential equations where the exponent is based on your uh, classical uh, transport um, equation. And yeah, I mean, basically what you're actually doing is taking a very complicated differential equation, simplifying it to a first order equation. So that's where the exponential solution is just a simple result from that. And yeah, to kind of go into that a little bit more detail, we can actually look at this equation. So again, this is our radio transport equation up here. And so for adding doubling, what we do is try to just reduce the dimensionality of this equation to simplify it down. So the first thing is, is we make the assumption that everything's steady state. So there's no time dependence in this equation. And that allows us to get rid of this differential up here and simplifies our radiance now to a six dimensional um, parameter. And then reduce the spatial coordinates down to one dimension. So rather than having an X, Y, Z coordinate system, we're just saying it's only going to exist in X. So the Y and Z components, what we're basically saying is that it's going to be completely homogeneous in those directions. So any solution at any given point is irrelevant. So we can just look at X and then look at, you know, try to integrate all the angular components of this equation, which most importantly really is a way of managing this integral over here, which is the most complicated part of the radio transport equation, um, and basically simplifies this integral into a way of weighting photons that go forward or backward. So any different angle, what we're assuming is that we're going to just integrate all that, measure any angle, and just say, did it go forward or did it go back? And by doing so, you end up with these coupled equations for the radiance going in the forward direction and radiance going in the backward direction. Um, and it's coupled for the fact that we have this kind of interaction between forward and backward going photons within the media itself. So this is my hand waving way of doing a derivation. I hope I haven't offended you, Vasan. I'm afraid you're taking notes of saying I, everything I done wrong, but. But having stated that and hoping that you just agree with me, uh, we can kind of move forward. So what adding doubling really comes down to describing is if you look at a slab of tissue and there are optical properties within that tissue, that if you have some source, so again, this Q term in the uh, equation, you can basically say, given optical properties within the tissue, I can actually calculate what will happen and what the radiance outside of that tissue, transmitted through the tissue would be, and what will come back from that tissue. And so you can actually simplify this equation down to looking at 
at a certain boundary one, after having traveled through the tissue, it's a product of your initial radiance injected into the tissue. Any photons that might be coming from the other side, and these operator terms of T and R, which are the transmittance and reflectance coefficients from this. So, <clears throat> from ideal sense, if we were going to start out with just a simple slab, you have a source of photons, the Q term, and oh, my battery's dying already. Um, and <clears throat> so at that point, we don't have anything in our negative going term here. So we have our light source coming down this way, which is this term. This is zero, so hence you can drop this out. And what you can actually now determine is the transmittance and reflectance of a tissue. By knowing what your initial source is, you can just divide this and look at the ratio of what you actually measure the photons you actually measure in the positive and negative direction relative to your source term will determine what your transmittance and reflectance would be. And again, based on the fact that this is a first order differential equation now, it's something you can directly calculate. So the interesting part about simplifying this equation in this way um, and what lends to, to the name of this adding doubling approach is the fact that by now simplifying the radiance at boundaries, you could actually do a lot of different uh, techniques or tricks in terms of this calculation. And the first of which is this doubling approach. And so the idea is that now you have this operator, it's based on the thickness of the slab, that this operator will scale directly with thickness of tissue. So doubling refers to the fact that if you have a slab of certain thickness, if you keep on adding slabs of the same material at equal thickness, it will literally just double what you're having. And the other thing is, is by describing things at boundaries, is the fact that you can even incorporate other slabs with different optical properties, and they are additive in this, based on this kind of linear operator approach. And so that's the adding. And what's really nice in terms of biophotonics is the fact that when you're actually looking at a physical sample, oftentimes the sample needs to be sandwiched between glass slides. So if you were actually to know what the optical property of your slide is on one side or the other, you can actually input that into your adding doubling model to actually try to isolate what the optical properties are of this sample that's unknown. So how is this a very powerful model? Just to regurgitate, this is an exact solution of the radio of transport equation. Um, and being so, there really is no restriction on the ratio of scattering or absorption. So this is not like you know, the standard diffusion approximation where you know, you're only limited. This equation only works in a certain area of absorption and scattering. This is insensitive to that. The catch is, is the equation is an exact solution. But whether you can measure it, that becomes a trick. And that's what we'll talk about later. But the model itself is insensitive to whatever values of absorption or scattering you have. There's really no ex restrictions on the anisotropy of your sample. And what you can do is also account for internal um, reflections at boundaries. So again, every single time you have light going from one medium to another medium, with a different index of refraction, you're going to get some amount of reflection. This model is something that is completely open and complementary to that approach. So you can go through and say, all right, what the model will describe is what happens to the light once it's in the 
the tissue and exits. At the boundaries, there's also going to be additional reflection, and that can be handled by, you know, Fresnel uh, reflection calculations. So it's completely uh, open to include those. But what are you going to be giving up with this technique? So there is no time dependence, so this is a steady state, so you really won't be able to look at any kind of dynamics with this model. It can't handle that. The layers that you'll be measuring the, the, has to be completely uniform. So the model itself assumes that you have a finite thickness in your x dimension. But by simplifying it down to one dimension, it assumes that everything else in the y or z dimension is infinite. So there's going to be some assumptions that you have to make from a practical sense to actually say, when you're actually making a measurement physically, what would you consider to be infinite in lateral extent? The absorption and scattering must be evenly distributed within the layer you're measuring. Again, this is a model to account for the radiance at the boundaries. So it just assumes that everything that happens within the slab of tissue you're measuring is going to be the same at every single spatial location. And your illumination, the source, must be uniform. So again, as a consequence of simplifying everything down to one dimension, your source term in the radio of transport is simplified down to a one-dimensional uh, parameter itself. So it also must be uniform in x, y, and omega, uh, all your angular components. So you know, the models that have been developed, you know, it can be collimated, it can be diffuse, but it has to be uniform. So just talking about this forward model, um, the adding doubling approach is a way to actually describe the total reflectance and transmittance at the boundaries of a tissue. It simplifies the radiance from your radio of transport equation down to one dimension with several assumptions. And in the end, it will simplify the model down to only, and I put in quotes, only five parameters. So that's your absorption, scattering, anisotropy, index of refraction, and the thickness of your sample. So it's a way to say, if you know all these different things, you can actually tell in advance how much light will be transmitted through the tissue, how much light will be reflected. And by making assumptions on the index or anisotropy of the tissue, you can then reduce this whole problem. You can also physically measure the thickness. And now you actually have something where you have a model where the outputs are the reflectance and transmittance that would be directly related to the absorption and scattering of the tissue. So this kind of addresses the ill-posedness issue that you would typically see in a lot of these inverse solver problems where you would have more inputs to the model versus what you can actually measure. Here you have two measurable properties, reflectance and transmittance, and two unknown quantities, the absorption and scattering. So it's a direct correlation. It's a posed problem. And so just to try to use some pseudo math. In the forward model sense, you have your adding doubling function where you have these five input parameters and you get out your reflectance and transmittance. In the inverse case, you make assumptions on index, anisotropy, and thickness. And based on the measured reflectance and transmittance, you can actually then go through and infer what the absorption and scattering of these tissue slabs would be. So in terms of just the forward model and adding doubling itself, are there any questions or concerns with what I said? Yes? I have a, a question. Uh, <clears throat> having read some of the literature, they talk about how uh, the scatter coefficient of, of, say, dermal collagen changes under tension. Mm -hmm. This seems like the way to to actually get an accurate uh, if you know the thickness change mm -hmm. you can calculate the volume expansion and then you can 
back out the scatter coefficient and actually know this? Potentially. The, the hard part would be you would have to make a measurement of the reflectance and transmittance, so it would have to be ex vivo. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, there's also going to be a lot of sample changes by removing sample the tissue. Changes by removing it so, so, yeah, uh, in principle, that's what you can do. But um, in, in practice, there's a much more challenging uh, problem to actually try to extract that information, and that's what we'll go into next. It but. seems very challenging to do it uh, on live tissue. Yes, yeah. Uh, I, I think this, this looks like there, the assumption is how much you've changed the tissue by excising it, which, of mm -hmm. course, is a massive fluid loss. Possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the most part, based on the geometry of this approach, it's mostly used in ex vivo tissue or samples to simulate tissue that you can actually get access on both sides of that slab to make the measurement of transmittance and reflectance. So um, in practice here at, at uh, UCI, we've been using this as an adjunct approach. So you can make measurements in vivo. Those are going to be typically reflectance-based measurements. So either in the temporal domain, spatial frequency domain, but to actually understand what's going on, we'll actually have these adjunct you know, tissue phantoms. And later on today, we'll have some mock setups where you can actually make measurements of these uh, silicone phantoms that would be used to kind of model exactly how our reflectance-based measurements are, knowing what the optical properties based on the reflectance and transmittance of these labs, and try to actually improve the technique and modeling of our spatial frequency or temporal spatial frequency uh, or temporal frequency uh, systems. So there's no other questions. So we'll just kind of jump into the kind of general philosophy of an inverse model. So as I stated before, with um, this solution of the uh, radiative transport equation, you have your inputs to your forward model which are, you know, typically absorption, scattering, anisotropy, index, and thickness. We can then go through and also do a bunch of different uh, tricks to actually reduce the dimensionality of these inputs. Um, so you've already been in introduced to this uh, primary called albedo, which is just a more dimensionless ratio between absorption and scattering. And there's this other parameter called tau, which is referred to as the optical thickness. So where D would be the physical thickness, like how thick your slab is, the optical thickness also considers what are the optical properties within that tissue itself. So that's kind of giving a sense in terms of a photon and not a ruler. What would it encounter in terms of tissue, in terms of absorption and scattering? That's albedo. And the optical thickness is now what would it experience as it travels through the tissue. So what does it kind of feel like for the photon to go through the tissue as opposed to the physical distance it travels. But by reducing that, again, we have solutions from the rate of transport for our negative going or backward going radiance and forward going radiance that we can describe our reflectance and transmittance. And again, using the index of refraction, we can also account for any surface reflection. So what happens to photons that don't even interact with the tissue itself? Because we need to be able to account for that. And the simplification of that integral from the radio transport you know, we are assuming a Haney-Greenstein uh, scattering function. So that kind of simplifies our scattering in terms of this one single number, this anisotropy factor. So the goal of an inverse solver is to say now, rather than having a model that will describe what is the reflectance and transmittance of a slab based on the absorption and scattering, we want to go through and to say, what is the absorption and scattering? of that slab based on the reflectance and transmittance that we measure. And this is a very iterative process. So in general, inverse solvers is something that you'll start with a forward model, guess 
what the optical properties of that tissue would be, calculate what reflectance and transmittance you should get based on that, and then compare that to the measured re results and say, okay, well, if I'm assuming an absorption and scattering of this amount, the reflectance and transmittance should be this. I measured different values, so let's do another guess and update that. You test for the goodness of fit, and you repeat until the answers in your forward model will converge with your measured data. And in the case of inverse adding doubling, you, know, you can actually start to map out well, how unique would these solutions be? Because in the end, you're measuring two values, transmittance and reflectance. And somehow you're going to say, based on these two numbers, I'm going to get two other numbers that reflect the optical properties of the tissue. So then the accuracy of your results will be dependent on how accurate you can actually measure that reflectance and transmittance. And so when you actually look at how does the optical property of the tissue in these slabs actually translate to the physical measurable quantities of transmission and reflectance? And so what we can see here is that when you look at just in terms of the albedo, so the ratio between scattering and absorption, that at very high albedo values, so again where scattering is dominant over absorption, you have a pretty wide range parameter space between the reflectance and transmit transmittance to converge to a solution. However, in cases where scattering is really low and or absorption is really high, this parameter space really collapses really fast. So all of a sudden you all have either really low reflectance or low um, transmittance, or in the worst case, low in both cases, any small error in your measured reflectance and transmittance can be a huge difference in what optical properties, what absorption and scattering you try to assign to those values. But in principle, in an ideal case, th these are unique solutions. There is no overlap. There is no area of confusion for that. But Small changes in reflectance and transmittance could result in large differences in the optical properties you actually uh, try to determine. So one way to kind of get around this in terms of an inverse solver is to try to use the similarity theory. So you would actually reparameterize your uh, variables. So instead of albedo and thickness, optical thickness, tau, you can actually go through and try to change them through this reparameterization process um, and come up with a new set of variables. Again, dimensionless, but what comes out of this is now a parameter space that when you're trying to solve and try to minimize this inverse solution problem, you have a space where it's less confined. So it's not that you would actually have something that would kind of converge down to a very small point here. The spacing of this kind of mesh that you're trying to solve is a little bit more open. So again, it's more of a mathematical trick to try to work on minimizing and converging to a single solution. But the consequence of doing this is that these parameters now are dimensionless and really don't have a direct physical interpretation. So, you know, there's something that you're going to be giving up for doing that. So that's just the kind of general model approach and how do you do inverse solving? The biggest question is, well, how do we actually do this in a lab? So how do you actually get the information you need from physical measurements to actually input into this inverse adding doubling approach? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It strikes me from what you've talked about here that there seems to be one 
or at least to me, there seems to be one one area that is is an area of concern, and that is that you have to assume a value for g. Yes. Um, do you just assume a value, or can you measure it in a different way and so use that measured value for as your assumption? Yeah. So there are ways to measure g in the field as a practical me measure. Most people just assume a value because it will vary as a function of wavelength. It will vary as a function of the scattering particles and the scattering distribution of particles within the tissue. But um, you know those will vary. You know maybe from 0.9 to 0.8 to 0.7. So usually the effect is pretty small. So people just take the shortcut of just saying, "I can assume a single value." But if you want to, you can measure it directly um, and actually have a more precise. So the question becomes, you know, this is referring to the anisotropy of tissue. So it really has an impact in areas which are, quote unquote, sub-diffusive. As soon as you start to get the thicker tissues, where you have enough scattering events that it becomes isotropic anyways, then G doesn't play a role anymore. But when you start looking at tissues where photons still remember the direction they came from, that's where it comes into play. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything more to that. So, yeah, certainly assuming G is, is, uh, is a limitation. Um, and it's also, in some sense, compromising the rigor of the method in, on some level because mm -hmm. the inverse adding doubling is ultimately uh, supposed to give you an exact solution to the radio transport equation. And, and even assuming G isn't actually sufficient to give you a rigorous solution. You have to have the complete phase function. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the last several years, uh, numerous groups have developed methods to collect backscattered light in close proximity of sources, either through fiber probes or even more recently using spatial frequency domain methods using high spatial frequencies. And uh, actually, there's a literature now going back at least 15 years looking at you know how assuming a given phase function um, in a material that actually possesses a different phase function, even with the same G, can lead you to erroneous results. Um, so um, this is a concern. Um, and I think, in theory, if you have thin enough samples, you could actually do an additional measurement that's called collimated transmittance, mm -hmm. not simply you could actually make a, a reflectance measurement, a transmittance measurement, the total diffuse, or you could also do a collimated transmittance where you only put a detector in the straight line trajectory with the source, and that could somehow constrain uh, the G values in that mm -hmm. way. Uh, or you could do goniometric measurements and right. do it, but of course all of this is ex vivo. So, um, but Rolf is also correct that once you have a a large optical thickness of your sample, you mitigate to a large degree the influence of the details of the phase function on the resulting impact of your optical properties. But certainly there are contexts where you're going to be very sensitive to G or, and other even higher moments of the phase function. What a large optical thickness <laughs> well, okay, optical thickness, I think it's defined in terms of the product of your physical thickness times the reduced scattering coefficient. So, um, so it means yeah, or the sum coefficient. of absorption in scattering oh, times, right. yeah. Yeah, I was thinking the limit of high yeah. scattering. But yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's also kind of a very vaguely defined term. So there's guidance, and we'll kind of touch up on this later on, in terms of making measurements with inverse adding doubling, what optical thicknesses are a practical um, 
sample to actually measure because the question becomes, this is all assuming a thick slab. So at what point does it become too thick that it just becomes too difficult to measure and really apply the uh, adding doubling approach because of the physical limitations of a physical measurement as opposed to this idealized infinite lateral extent, you know, you would actually need to have an infinitely large integrating sphere with an infinitely large entrance port to capture everything. So kind of given what we're actually working with and physical finite parameters, what would be the kind of sample that you can actually approximate to fit this exact solution? So that's the kind of cruel irony of adding doubling is that it is an exact solution, but where it fails is actually dealing with it in real physical terms. So, so yeah, so I don't know if there's any other questions before we start jumping into. I just want to know how do you measure the goodness of your fit? Hmm? How do you measure the goodness of your fit? So, um, in terms of the inverse solver, um, there's a lot of different approaches to do a minimization. So, like, there's chi squared kind of different metrics to actually go through and say how well does this agree and then trying to actually uh, minimize that um, determining okay if this is the error you get between your guessed set of optical properties and the measured parameters that you get how do you actually converge to those results but um, but yeah I mean it's it's usually some minimization based on tolerances to say well what's close enough to that because yeah the forward is an exact solution, but to get to those results in an inverse model, it's more or less, guess, see how close it is, try again, and it's just a question of at what point do you just stop? What's good enough? What's close enough? How accurate do you really need to know your absorption and scattering? So, I don't know. Did you want to add something to that? I just wanted to add that this issue of goodness of fit and metrics will be addressed in um, Dr. Hayakawa's lecture tomorrow, who's going to talk about inverse solvers and gradient-based algorithms, sensitivities, and, and how you characterize goodness of fit. So this won't be the last, the last uh, point that we address that issue, which is an important issue. All right. Okay. So... Now, by describing the kind of forward model that will describe, you know, that will give us a basis to actually determine what would happen in terms of reflectance and transmittance of a sample towards an inverse solver, to s how do you use those output parameters as inputs to an inverse solver? How do you actually make a physical measurement of this? How do you actually get reflectance and transmittance? And so, going back to the original forward model, we have now this 1D case where we went through and integrated all angular contributions into a singular, or a single dimension. So the question is, is now if you try to think about a slab, send light into it, you're going to have scattering going through absorption interacting with that light, and when it exits on the other side, the photons can be going in any direction over 2 pi. Or if it interacts and reflects back, it can be exiting over two pi dimensions. So how would we actually measure what that diffuse reflectance and transmittance would be? And the way we do that is by utilizing something called an integrating sphere. So typical inverse adding doubling setups, you would have your slab of tissue and to make a transmittance measurement, you have your light source, collimate the beam, send it through your sample. At that point, photons can be exiting at almost any angle. But if it's right up near the front of this sphere, that the angles will then go through, bounce off of the reflective surfaces of the sphere. And literally, this is a physical interpretation of integration, what you see here. So, out of all these angles, they will just go and bounce within the sphere, and you'll have a detector at a small point, and that will sample what is the relative intensity that is integrated out of all the photons that travel through your sample into the sphere. 
So it basically kind of lets it bounce around enough, so again, kind of like isotropic scattering, where it just forgets what the angular dependence is. It just integrates all that, so you can measure it. Likewise, for all the light that is reflected off of your sample, you put the sample on the other side, send the beam straight through. Anything that's specularly ref reflected, so again, based on index mismatch between your sample and air, will be reflected straight back out of the sphere. It won't interact with the sphere itself, so only the light that is scattered will be integrated by the sphere, and you can measure that. So the key parts are you have to have a source, you have your integrating sphere, and then you have to have some means of detecting the light that's being integrated over all these angles. So, again, unlike an idealized solution where the forward model is based on, you actually have now a physical uh, sphere to do the integration. You have a physical light source and a physical detector. These are also things that are now going to be incorporating non-idealities into the interpretation of that forward model. So, as I said before, these integrating spheres are pretty much what they sound like. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, for the model, um, is it only like one wavelength the light, or is it supposed to be a broadband it, source? Because I guess yeah. here I see the spectrophotometer. Yeah. So you're getting, I guess, the uh, measurements that you can get at different wavelengths. Yeah. So the model itself, it can be at any wavelength. Mm -hmm. So the model just describes if you have a source of light at a given wavelength, what is the absorption and scattering? at that wavelength. So you can actually have multiple wavelengths, and the solution would be at each wavelength, what is the absorption and scattering? So um, classically, in most cases, inverse adding doubling is used at a single wavelength. Um, what we've been doing here is actually saying, well, the solution works for any combination of absorption and scattering, so why do one wavelength when you can do broadband and do multiple wavelengths? So. So yeah, the model itself, it's on a wavelength by wavelength basis because it's just literally looking at a reflectance and transmittance correlated to an absorption and scattering. So that can be at 650 nanometers, it could be at 450 nanometers, it could be anywhere in between. The, the, the model itself will work at all wavelengths. Um, so it's just a question of what wavelengths do you use and each wavelength will be a unique solution. Um, so it assumes that the light you send to your sample, it enters the sample once and then comes out of the sample once for the uh, transmittance portion. So, I mean, it can interact multiple times okay. with the sample. Um, but basically what it's saying is that if you send light into the sample, what is the net effect at the boundary in the end? So it can interact as much as it wants to within it, but then in the end, how much light comes out on one side of that sample and how much light comes out on the other side of the sample. And the stuff that happens and the differences between those would describe what is being absorbed versus scattering within that tissue. So when in the transmittance case, when that light passes the sample and goes into the integrating sphere, mm -hmm. is there any concern that it could go back to the sample? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there are ways of actually, again, dealing with the, the physical reality and how do you actually account for the non-idealities of the integrating sphere. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, it becomes very, very complicated, but again, it's also a case of the amount of light that will actually go through, what's the likelihood of that photon bouncing back, mm -hmm. hitting the sample again outside of all the different area of the sphere. Right. But yeah, okay. but yeah, that's actually, people have thought about that okay. in great detail. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah, it may be worth commenting that even though the method um, that's been described is called adding doubling, uh, you don't have to take the doubling completely seriously in the, in the following sense. You can have um, a layer of 
rather large thickness up against a layer of or more than one which is very thin and you don't need to do successive doublings in order to get the transport through the thick layer. There is a technique for converting the original two uh, one-dimensional problems to a, which has a two-point boundary, it's a two-point boundary problem. You assume uh, input on the left and input on the right. You can convert that through a technique called invariant embedding which produces an initial value problem. That means that you can, for practical, uh, in practical terms, it means that you can find the output, the reflect, the transfers across the boundary as a function of the thickness of the slab itself. So capital little d in, in uh, Rolf's example is now going to be able to be varied. And so uh, I, I don't know if that's uh, taken advantage of in, in the uh, biocomputational literature or not. Right. No, I mean, I think, you know, the doubling aspect, it's more or less just a demonstration that it's, this solution is scalable by thickness. So I think the only practical way to actually double something is that if you actually want to try to approximate what is the internal radiance of a, a sample that you can actually subdivide it and try to map that out but again that's the solutions are only at boundaries so now it becomes a discretization issue of trying to go through and subdivide a given thickness but you know the the important part in what's utilized here is more or less that it's scalable with thickness but the adding part is important for the practical aspect of if you start to sandwich optical properties between different things. So in terms of, say, microscope slides or cuvette walls, how do you actually account for the optical properties of that versus what you're actually interested in within that sample? So, so yeah. Anything else? So, can I go back to the, the physical measurement? So as I kind of stated before, you have this integrating sphere. And the idea is that by having the sphere where, again, it's very white, so it's usually spectral on inside, a rough surface, so it's more acting like a diffuse, highly reflective scattering um, agent that it will be able to kind of integrate any light from any angle transmitted through the sample here. Likewise, for the reflectance, if you send light straight through, that any light that exits that sample at any angle will be kind of reflected and integrated within that sphere itself. But we have to let reality set in for a moment because, again, in theory, this is a wonderful solution to the integral of your radiative transport equation, but integrating spheres are not perfect integrators. There are limitations to what it can do and how it actually works that we need to account for. The reflectance and transmittance are relative measurements. So again, back to our original solution of, of radians, it was the ratio between what you actually put into the sample versus what you get out. So you have to be aware of the source that you use. And when you actually detect your signal, you have to be aware of the fact that we're using you know, these different types of detectors, but they have their own noise characteristics, bias. You have to be very careful on what you actually detect and how does that actually re reflect back to the reflectance and transmittance of our perfect solution. And the, the samples itself, they are finite. So the model assumes that it's going to be infinite in lateral extent, it's going to be completely homo homogeneous, and that the thickness of that sample is exactly known. In reality, we have to think about exactly what does that mean and how well do our samples actually match our model. So. To just focus on the integrating sphere itself, 
As I said, they are not perfect. The walls of the integrating sphere are not 100% reflective, so they're more like 99, 98%. So they're going to get losses from there. So you know your integral now needs to account for the physical um, limitations of your sphere. And also, not all the angles are actually integrated in the sphere. So you have things like your sample port. So there's a hole that you have to send light through. You put your sample in. That angle, subtended by that hole, is not a part of your integral. So you're now no longer really integrating over 4 pi steradians. It's going to be some value less than that. You have your reflectance port. You have your detector port. So you have to account for that. But thankfully, as I had mentioned and alluded to earlier, is people have thought about this problem and took a long time and came up with a way of describing what will happen to photons after multiple reflections within the sphere, accounting for the fact that it's not a perfect 4 pi steradian integrator, that the reflectivity of the wall is not perfect. So they went through and did the long, hard calculations and committed it to code. So we don't have to ever look at that again. But but you know, it's one thing to kind of be aware of. So, so be happy that you don't have to deal with it, but be aware that it exists. So in terms of calibration, again, reflectance and transmittance are relative quantities. So in order to actually measure this, you need to account for the stability of your source, the accuracy of your detector and performance of your detector. So usually what you all have to do is calibrate your system in order to actually determine this relative reflectance and transmittance quantity. So again, typically for these integrating spheres, what you would do is to say, based on a stable light source, if I have no sample in front, a re known reflectance standard at the back, so usually something that matches what the reflectance of the internal sphere properties are, that would be the most light you could actually integrate. So that's your kind of 100% transmittance. And then if you remove that or block your light source, that's the lowest signal you can get. That would be your 0%. So your reflectance and transmittance would be then something that's a ratio between these two different uh, measurements. And so the accuracy of how well you can actually calibrate your sphere well, they determine how well you can actually measure your reflectance and transmittance. Yes? I just wanted to emphasize, you know, that these are measurements that are done over all of your wavelengths, right? Yes. So that also will inherently calibrate out any wavelength variations in the properties of the reflectance properties of the spheres, mm -hmm. as well as any wavelength dependence in the sensitivity of your detector. So basically, you're providing bounds of zero signal to 100% signal, and you'll have finite signal, mm -hmm. you know, and then that gives you your, your basically your dynamic range of your measurement. And uh, you, you should probably do it, you probably do that scan multiple times, right, to average through that, right? So yeah, just yeah. wanted to emphasize, so there's not only the non, Ideality is due to the sphere, but of course you also have the, the spectral dependence of your detector as well, right. which is all captured by doing this. So that's how you would actually go through and collect the data when you actually process it. Um, luckily, yet again, people have been working with this type of approach for quite some time, thought about these problems really hard struggled and actually produced software that's freely available on the web. So this is the, the code that has been heralded by uh, Scott Prawl um, to actually do inverse adding, um, adding doubling calculations. So all you really need to do is input what your reflectance and transmittance values are, and it will do all the other work. So 
when we talked about originally this idealized model, it seems quite simple. Be aware of the physical limitations, correct for it. Um, he's done a lot more work to actually account for all this in the code itself. So the code will go through, take account of the physical properties of your sphere. So what is the diameter of the sphere? So how much surface area does it have relative to the size of your reflectance and transmittance ports, your detector ports, multiple reflectance off those surfaces, all those equations, it's all been done for you. Um, this code will also account for the sample geometry and specular reflection. So again, is it a bare sample? What's the index of refraction of your bare sample versus air? It will account for any specular reflection in both transmittance and reflectance case. Is it sandwich, sandwiched between two pieces of glass or is it in a cuvette? What is the optical properties of that cuvette? The index, what are the multiple reflections you could potentially get between the boundary between air, your cuvette wall, your cuvette wall, your sample, sample cuvette wall, cuvette wall, and inside the integrating sphere. So it's been able to kind of calculate all that stuff for you. It's a big headache to try to think about all these multiple reflections. They've done it. But the biggest thing, and what really takes the longest time for it to actually run through and process the data, is that it also thinks about the physical limitations of the sphere in the context of when you actually have light interacting with your sample. It's a physical dimension of your entrance port to the sphere. You could potentially have a beam size of a certain relative size where light would scatter, bounce around within your sample, and still either go through your sample in the form of transmittance or reflectance, but never actually enter the sphere because of the physical dimensions of the sphere itself. So this, this is the concept of these side light losses. So you would actually have in this little diagram here, if your beam, source beam comes through, it interacts with the sample, you can have light transmitted that enters the sphere, but it can be also scattering and physically exit and never actually enter the sphere. So what the beauty of this code is, is the fact that it will go through and say, if your beam size is a certain diameter, your entrance port or reflecting port is a certain you know, uh, diameter, you can go through, run the inverse adding doubling, converge to a solution. It would then go through and run a Monte Carlo and say, well, if these are the actual optical properties of your sample, how many photons would we not measure on this? And say, okay, well, that's a source of error. Then reconverge, recalculate, saying, okay, well, now we've actually are measuring only the transmittance over a certain limited angle. We cannot account for these other ones that will be never measured itself. What would that solution be? So, so yeah, I mean, I think the big take home message is there's been a lot of work done to actually think about the physical parameters of this and how that would actually affect the measurements itself. So that would be in kind of solving this inverse adding doubling problem, but it doesn't excuse one's ability to actually set up a system and know exactly what those limitations are. So you also have to think about the sample itself. So again, inverse adding doubling and the code that Scott Paul, uh, Paul has provided will not make any assumptions on the sample itself. So if you have surface roughness, that will reflect, uh, or affect how much light is specular, specularly uh, reflected versus what actually goes in. The code assumes that your sample is perfectly flat. So you have a flat, smooth surface that the specular reflection can be, can be described by Fresnel, nothing else. So if you have a rough surface, it's not going to give you a precise result. Yeah. Whether the tissue is heterogeneous. So again, it assumes that everything is homogeneous in lateral extent. If it's not uniform, you have to kind of consider the fact that, okay, when I place the beam and interrogate this volume of tissue, what I'm actually trying to do is integrate all the optical properties in that area, but also assume that everything surrounding it is the same. 
So if it's at a boundary, that can affect uh, what results you get. Thickness variance, again, this is all directly scaled to thickness of your tissue. So if the thickness of your sample varies where you're measuring it, and particularly bad is if you measure your reflectance and transmittance at two different locations with two different thicknesses, that will also corrupt uh, the results that you get. So, important take-home messages is the fact that even though a lot of work has been done to try to solve all these different issues in, in terms of computing optical properties based on your reflectance and transmittance measurements, that you as a user would need to actually know what are the practical constraints and limitations of the model to determine how best to take advantage of what it has to offer. So I just have kind of three rules of thumbs. First one being that when you're going to try to attempt to use this, you want to minimize your sample non-idealities. So what I just referred to before, think about the thickness of your sample. So thinner samples will minimize side light losses because now you have less opportunities for photons to escape and never enter the sphere. But there are also consequences of that because the thinner the sample, when it comes to transmittance, you're going to typically have high transmittance and really low reflectance because it's so thin, there's less scattering events involved. Um, you know, people have looked at this, and again, originally, or earlier, someone had asked about, you know, the question about optical thickness. So, as a rule of thumb, people have suggested that this optical thickness parameter tau, if it's between 0.75 and 12, when we actually show those diagrams of the parameter space, that that spans a reasonable space in terms of reflectance and transmittance, where you can actually get reasonable results. It's somewhat orthogonal in terms of the, the mesh coordinates um, that will map onto reflectance and transmittance. But beyond that, it becomes very challenging. So, you know, to think about if you have some anticipation about what the optical properties of your sample would be versus um, what you intend to measure, that you can actually potentially vary the thickness to match within this range to know that you're going to get more robust solutions. Um, and also your position to actually measure the sample thickness. Again, it scales directly with thickness. So if you are 10% wrong on what you think your thickness of the sample is, your optical properties will also scale by 10%. So, yeah, and then in terms of preparing your sample, you know, you, what you want to do is mimic as much as you can a slab of infinite lateral extent. So, no surface roughness, keep the thickness even, and minimize any spatial heterogeneities relative to the illumination size that you're using. So, rule number two is about instrument stability and configurability. Once you set this instrument up, you want to be able to use it in a way that's reliable. So you have to keep in mind that integrating spheres as a component are very lossy. So again, you're looking at something where you shine light into a reflective surface that's still 99%, but then you're picking off a very small portion of the photons entering those spheres. So there are huge, huge light losses if you were trying to do like a light budget of that type of a setup. It's astonishingly bad. But so when it comes to actually making reflection and transmittance measurements, you know, you have to think about, all right, either we have to come up with some way to actually put as more light into the system or have really, really sensitive detectors that can actually go through and detect low light level conditions. Using a single sphere, which are the examples that I've been using up to this point, are pretty easy and straightforward to calibrate, but it requires collimating the beam, and especially in the case of what we do here, where we do things spectrally, not a single wavelength, that is very challenging to actually think about the optics of collimating a broadband beam. Um, and that also 
has great opportunities for rejecting a lot of your source illumination, making this, this system even lower, lossy. So dual spheres can go through and counteract that. You can actually have a converging beam deal with a small angular component to your source. You get more photons through that way, but the uh, calibration of that system are a little bit more challenging. And again, in terms of configurability, having a variable iris, so if you have a collimated beam that if you can control the spot size, that way you can easily tune your system based on the heterogeneity of the sample you're trying to measure um, and not have to realign the system every single time. But you have the issue of integration because it's going to be a very lossy system. So third rule, and it probably should be the first rule, is to have an expectation of the optical properties you want to measure. So what we can't control are the inefficiencies of the actual physical measurements. But what we do have is an exact solution. So we have some way of anticipating what we will expect to encounter. So if you know exactly what the optical property or have some idea of what you intend to measure or the range you intend to measure, you can anticipate what you're going to encounter when you actually make the physical measurements. But you could also use other references that approximate that, that you actually know in advance to actually calibrate your system as a sanity check. Um, so using short path length cuvettes with controlled, uh, uh, con controlled concentrations of dyes or controlled concentrations of microspheres where you can actually model using me theory what the scattering properties should be in advance will give you some idea and some way of actually validating your unknown sample to make sure it fits within a range. Um, using silicone phantoms, again, this is in the lab component. Um, you'll be making measurements of some of these. The nice thing is, is you can make them, fix them, and they'll be stable over time, so you can always measure them again and again. And also, by having some idea of what op optical properties you intend to measure, you can also anticipate how unique your measurement will be, you can actually go through and put it into the forward model and span the space to say how accurate and get some sense of how accurate your measurement needs to be in order to get a unique solution for what you intend to measure. So I have a list of references um, that I used for this presentation. And since I'm running a little behind schedule, um, I had a couple of examples of where we used inverse adding doubling, but I'll just kind of quickly go through that. So one way is actually looking at a project of, yeah. Bro, why don't we uh, break for lunch and then before we start the lab, maybe mm. you can go through that now uh, at that time. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't we, why don't we pause now and uh, open it up for questions? First, thank you for this presentation. Yeah. So yeah. I think you're going to introduce the lab right now, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I'm just trying to yeah, get to the... Get stuff. to the... <laughs> so it's much stuff. Uh, come on. So, so yeah. So in the afternoon, we have um, set up a lab, and there's two main parts to it. So as opposed to me standing up here talking about all this stuff, talking about what you need to be aware of and be concerned about... Um, we have one setup, uh, well actually on all the different lab computers, there's a simulated data GUI. So this will give you some way of actually loading simulated data, and I think it's brain matter and liver uh, tissue. So the idea there is one's going to be um, really highly absorptive, low scattering. The other one's going to be highly scattering, low absorption. These were simulated spectra based on a one millimeter thickness of tissue. And so with this GUI, what you'll be able to do is run the data, see what the errors are, fit for chromophores, and then go through and say, well, what if I'm off by 10% in thickness? How does that actually affect the data? What if, as what was brought up before, was you know, if the anisotropy, 
is not exactly 0.8? What if it varies? How would that, in a gross sense, affect the outputs of the data? Um, what if the index of refraction varies? So it's a way of just loading data, putting stuff on there. You can actually add noise. You can add noise and then try to smooth the data. You know, typical things that you will do experimentally. How does that actually affect the outputs um, that you get? Then the other part is we actually have put together two integrating sphere systems and have some sample thin slab uh, silicone phantoms with different dyes in them that you can actually go through and actually do a integrating sphere measurements. Collect reflectance and transmittance, submit them to this code that Scott Prawl had put together and see what you get out of it. And you know, there the idea is the fact that you can make these measurements and it's easy to collect data. It's easy to put them to a code and the code will spit out numbers. But the question in the end is, do they really mean anything? How accurate and how robust would they be? So how do you actually convince yourself that when you make an experimental measurement, that the numbers you get out of the end when you use these models really reflect what reality is. Because, yeah, you have two inputs, you get two outputs, they're numbers. Great. But there's a lot of steps along the way where things can go wrong, so how do you actually know what you're doing? So the idea is you can actually go through, give a hand, try the stuff out, see what you can get, and then ask yourself, how well do you actually trust the results that you get? So that's what's going to be going on in the afternoon. Um, are there any other questions? It would seem that between uh, not knowing what G is mm -hmm. and uh, imprecision and cutting the thickness of the tissue sample, that you kind of you're kind of forced into getting a, a thicker and thicker tissue sample. So yeah, I mean there's there's a lot of um, ways that you could actually go through it. I mean yeah, you can make a thinner sample, and again the question is is well what's the precision that you can make that sample at? So there's ways this, that you can actually constrain that. Um, in terms of G, the question will be, and, and what hopefully the first part of the lab will show is that based on the optical properties and the thickness of your sample, the effect of G can be large or it can be inconsequential. So it's a matter of, you know, trying to get some sense of, you know, at what point do these parameters really affect what you're doing? Is it going to be a 1% error? Is it going to be a 50% error? And knowing exactly when each one comes to play will direct how sensitive you need to be in preparing your sample and your setup to actually address that issue. The, uh, the one of the things that would concern me is the tissue drying out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess, you know, in a, especially in a dry environment, you want to keep a nice, humid, wet environment mm -hmm. and very quickly get the sample on to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of times where if you have an ex vivo tissue sample, it would be sandwiched in an optical cell, so it'd be hydrated that way. But yeah, as a function of time, you know, they will degrade. So it's when do you actually measure it and understand the temporal dynamics of it. They might be slowly changing, but you know, to actually go through and think about the sample preparation that way. So. Right. So I think there are a couple of um, competing considerations, right? Certainly uh, non-uniformities in the sample thickness work against you. Um, so you may think that you want to do larger sample thicknesses, but you don't want to make the sample thicknesses so large that you don't have a, a sufficient amount of transmittance or reflectance. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to your rule three uh, slide, I think it's slide 33. It's easier to just jump this way. Yeah. 33. Great. If you project that. So you'll just notice that the interval in which you're going to be 
getting sensitivity is that you want both the transmission and the reflectance to be between 20 and 80 percent. So as opposed to trying to get an optical thickness between 0.75 and 12, kind of practically you want to get between 20 and 80 percent right. reflectance or, tra and or transmittance. And so uh, that will bound. You can go thick, but not too thick. <laughs> Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're not going to get any transmittance, and then you're not going to be able to determine optical properties. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the kind of danger of the fact that this is an exact solution. The adding doubling is an exact so solution of the radiative transport. So it will work in all cases, but in practical senses, when you actually make measurements, if you're going to be beyond that kind of 20 to 80 percent reflectance and transmittance space, you can still, the model will still work. It's just, how well you, can you actually make the measurement to fit the model? Well, not only that, but I think also the sensitivity, based on that you have an intrinsic amount of noise or imprecision mm -hmm. in your measurement, then the sensitivity of the r derived optical properties to noise will be greater. And the other thing you have to be concerned about, and you'll get the experience of this in your lab, is that um, if there is a lot of collimated light coming out and being transmitted, then you're going to see that you're going to be much more sensitive to errors in G in the recovered optical properties mm -hmm. than in the case where you have a thicker sample, there's a lot of scattering, then you're going to wash out the impact of G. And so hopefully this lab will give you a lot of insight as to when the details of the phase function matter versus cases where the details of the phase function do not matter. And um, I think a lot of these concepts will be driven home by the actual practical experience of this lab and fooling around with the data. When you showed a plot, uh, I guess it was a couple of days ago, of scatter coefficients for different types of tissues, is this the method that, that most people are using? Yeah, many this people is are it. using this, okay. but also a lot of people are doing in vivo measurements. Okay. So they're just relying on various reflectance space measurements, which we're going to be talking about on, on Thursday and Friday. This is kind of the first mm -hmm. method that was developed in the field. So it's a simple, uh, conceptually. Conceptually simple, simple. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of these methods have, have hidden or not so hidden uh, challenges and complications. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? OK, so let's break for lunch. Thanks for your attention. Long mornings, long lectures, and yeah. 